One of the most outstanding attributes of God that we have come to understand in our study of God is his love. The love of God is so outstanding that it makes him stand out in everything he does. In fact, the Bible was speaking and the Bible said, as wicked as your earthly parents are, he said, will you ask them for fish and they give you a serpent? He said, will you ask them for bread and they give you a stone? Now, the last time I checked, my mother was not wicked. My father has never been wicked to me. And so when I probed into that scripture, I tried to understand what God was talking about. And the point God was trying to advance was to give you a comparison. A comparison that reveals the overwhelming dimension of his love. God is not calling our parents wicked as it were. Because the Bible attests to the fact that we should honor our parents because they are a blessing to us. And so what God was trying to reveal to us in that scripture is the fact that although our parents are so loving, they are such a blessing to us. But compared to his love for us, the best our parents have to offer is wickedness. So it reveals to you the overwhelming dimension of the love of God. And when you begin to study the love of God, you will discover that on account of his love, there are many insurance systems he has put in place that will serve as an advantage for the believer because he understands that we grow from childhood to maturity. And if these insurance systems are not put in place, all of us will die before we mature. And even when we mature, we will still need it. Because we are dealing with an adversary that is a captain of wickedness. God knows that if he does not create insurance systems, either our ignorance destroys us or the devil destroys us. Because the world we are walking in is a wicked and treacherous world. According to Isaiah 60 from verse 1 to 3 and Psalm 74 verse 20, he created an insurance system for our safety. And the first of that system is eternal life. God knows that if you function here as a man, you'll be defeated. So he decided to upgrade your class of existence. So although you are working with men, but you are not a man. You are a hybrid creature. He decided to put the life that powers him on your inside. So that the things he can do, you also will have the capability to do it. And so John 3, 15 and 16 say, For God so loved the world that he gave unto us what? Eternal life. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So eternal life becomes an eternal insurance system against perishing. A man that carries eternal life can never know destruction. God gave us another insurance system called faith. There are two kinds of faith principally in scripture when you study the first kind of faith is the faith that the fathers of old had. Is the Abrahamic kind of faith. We also have a heritage of the Abrahamic kind of faith. But we don't dwell there. We have gone past that level. The Abrahamic kind of faith is a faith that in essence is defined by your trust in God. If you operate the Abrahamic order of faith, the potency of your faith is defined by the degree to which you what? put your trust in God. So in Romans chapter 4 verse 1, Paul was speaking. He said, what did Abraham, our father, according to the flesh found? And he began to x-ray the scripture and he showed us that what Abraham found was a technology in God. That the way a man can provoke intervention from the realm of God is for that man to trust God. Abraham was the first who discovered that all the answers men are looking for is with God. But the only way you can receive that answer from the realm of God is to trust him. The moment you are able to trust God, answers download into your realm. And that faith became an order of faith 
that everybody who operated before Christ had to possess in order to have a stake with God. Because if you don't trust God, you can't walk with God. And that's why Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 6 to 7 made us to understand. He said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He said, for whoever cometh to him must believe that he is and he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, that was where God began with man in the journey of faith. But that's not where God wanted to stop. Because the faith we operate with now is not the Abrahamic kind of faith. We begin with the Abrahamic kind of faith because it is the Abrahamic kind of faith that brings you into salvation. You have to trust God in order to receive salvation. But the moment you receive salvation, the faith economy changes. The faith we operate with now is called the God kind of faith. Now, this is the difference. If Abrahamic faith is you trusting in God, for God to intervene, what will you now do if you have the faith of God? Does God trust in God? So faith, the economy of faith now changes. When you have the Abrahamic kind of faith, the degree to which you trust God is what determines the answer you have. But when you have the God kind of faith, you don't necessarily trust God anymore. You are already called a believer. When you have the God kind of faith, the ability of God is put on your inside. So what God does, you do. The faith we have now, it begins from trusting in God, but it has gone beyond trusting in God. It is now an understanding that the ability of God is on our inside. That's why now, every time we manifest, we thank God. We give God praise for considering us worthy to host his power. The gift of God is that he gave you the right to use the name of God. It's like a patent. Somebody designs a program, runs that program, and it works. And then he gives you the right to use it. You can make a lot of money from it because you have the right to use it. But you see, even though you have the right to use the name of Jesus, it will not be effective in your life until you know what that name represents in the spirit. The reason many people are shouting the name of Jesus but they are not having results is because they don't know what that name represents. So they don't even know how to channel their faith. And so in the study of the name of Jesus, the first fundamental thing that you need to know is what that name represents. That's what will determine whether your faith will work or not. Because it will give you expectation, it will give direction to your energy, and it will give confidence to what you are doing. Because you are sure that this name represents something. Five things that the name of Jesus represents very quickly. Number one, the name of Jesus is the key for signs and wonders. Everywhere you see a sign and a wonder take place, know that at the foundation is the name of Jesus. If you know this truth, you will know that your fasting brings you into revelation. You will know that your prayer brings you into revelation. But you will never build your confidence on your fasting and your prayer. The reason many people, even though they fast and pray, still feel insufficient is because the devil will always whisper to them they didn't pray enough. They didn't fast enough. See, we will keep praying until we live here. There is no such thing as praying enough. Prayer is a lifestyle. Fasting is a lifestyle. So grow in it, increase in it, improve in it. In fact, the Bible says pray without ceasing. You are not expected to stop praying. But what will substantiate your prayer, your fasting, your study of the word, is your revelation of that name. And so when you come out, when you are done praying and fasting, you must build your audacity on the name of Jesus. He said the reason signs will follow the believers is because they will stand on my name. The moment they step out of my name, they step out of signs. If I pray, it's good because the anointing of my life is volatile. But in case I don't pray, I don't think the result should diminish. Because whether I pray or not, I'm going in the name of Jesus. Whether I fast or not, I'm going in the name of Jesus. But I must pray and fast because my growth depends on prayer. My growth depends on fasting. But even though I'm fasting and praying, I will never make the mistake of assuming because if I assume that the result will be commanded by my fasting, then I will take the credit. I will say it's because I fasted. But the Bible says we have this treasure in 18 vessel. That the excellency might be of God and not of man. The system is not designed for you to be able to take the credit. The praise must return to him. And this is why at the end of the day, what produces the result must be tied to Jesus Christ. 
I've been to prophetic conferences in our generation, apostolic conferences in our generation, and the deaf came deaf and left deaf. Cripples came cripple and went cripple. Meanwhile, people that have had encounters in the third heaven were there. But we didn't see any result. Why? Because when you remove the name of Jesus, you remove miracles. When you remove the name of Jesus, you remove signs and wonders. When you remove the name of Jesus, everything supernatural dies down. Because the name of Jesus is the seal for miracles, for signs, and for wonders. The second thing the name of Jesus represents is access and divine approval. Every time you call the name of Jesus, the consciousness that you well up in your mind is that God has accepted you. The name of Jesus is the seal of approval in the realm of God. That is why not everybody was given the name. The name was given to us that are justified. The name was given to us that are already accepted in the beloved. And so when you call the name of Jesus, it should be a reminder to you that right here, right now, God is not angry with me. If I, So long as I can call that name, it means God is not angry with me. It means God has opened his realm to me. Jesus was speaking in John 14, verse 13 and 14. He said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name. He said, my father will grant it unto you. In John 16, 23, 20, 24. He said, until now you have asked for nothing. He said, ask that you may receive that your joy may be complete. He said, for verily, verily I say unto you, whatsoever you ask in my, my name. He said, my father will grant it. If you come in the name of Jesus, God can't reject you. That's why God is careful before naming the name of God on, of Jesus on your life. You can't be rejected by God if the name of Jesus is on your life. It's a seed of God's approval. Number three. The name of Jesus gives you authority over every demonic entity. In Mark 16, 17, it said, In my name, cast out devils. It's plural. Whatever they are, whichever they are, whichever rank, whichever class. He said, in my name, cast out devils. All of the authority of God is invested in the name of Jesus. That's the riches of that name. When you carry that name, tell yourself, the totality of the authority of heaven is with me. I have all the powers in heaven. I have all the authority of heaven. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee bow in heaven on earth and even in the world beneath. So throw me to hell today, I will not be afraid. Because I know every spirit there bows at the name of Jesus. Finally, the name of Jesus is a seal of salvation and of preservation. In Matthew 1 21, he said, you will give birth to a child and his name shall be called Jesus. He said, for he shall save his people from their sins. In Acts 4 12, he said, there is no name under heaven given by which men shall be saved. The name of Jesus is where salvation is invested. The name of Jesus is where preservation is invested. In fact, in Proverbs 18.10, it said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. It said the righteous run therein and they are saved. Many Christians don't know what they carry. The insurance that the name of Jesus brings to you, even the strongest military intelligence cannot bring it. But the degree to which you see it is your consciousness.